Today, we're going to be speaking with Jason De La Roca, who is a game industry entrepreneur, funding advisor, and cluster expert. He specializes in business, partnership development, pitching funding, and ecosystem cluster development. As the co-founder of Execution Labs, he was a hands-on early stage investor to over 20 independent game studios from North America and Europe. Between 2000 to 2009, he served as the executive director of the International Game Developers Association, IGDA, and was honored for his industry building efforts with the inaugural Ambassador Award at the Game Developers Conference. In 2009, Jason was named to Game Developer Magazine's Power 50, a list which provides 50 of the most important contributors to the state of the game industry. As a sought-after expert on the game industry, Jason has lectured at conferences and universities worldwide. I can't wait to begin to speak with Jason about all these amazing experiences he has had and that he has to share. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Jason, for being here today. Welcome, everybody, to this new amazing episode. How is everything going there in Montreal, Jason? Um, after that, maybe you can expand a little bit on who you are or your background. Yeah, sure. Well, Dana, thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here in Montreal, uh, uh, born and raised and been here my, my whole life. Uh, Montreal is great. I mean, the, it's actually nice, uh, sunny weather today. It's uh, summertime, so, so no no snow. Uh, and uh, Montreal is an awesome city. And importantly, is a great gaming city. There's so many amazing game studios and game developers uh, here in Montreal. And so uh, uh, in part, that's why I've, I've always stayed here in Montreal and, and lived and worked here in the game industry. Yes, that's amazing. I actually, locally where I live, which is Winnipeg, I met a great creator, developer, designer, etc., the founder of a company. He started the company now, it's launching Oculus, but he decided to move to Montreal. Oh. <laughs> he said, there is a reason why I moved to Montreal. And now you're telling me. That's interesting. I am actually planning a trip to Montreal. Whenever I go there, maybe I invite you for a coffee and maybe we do a little recording or something to share with you. Sure. sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, listen, M Montreal is a, it's a lovely city, lots of nice cafes and amazing restaurants. I mean, we have the whole French influence that gives it a bit uh, of, a, yeah. of, a, of a European vibe. Uh -huh. But interestingly, it is, it is the main game development center and hub in Canada. Oh my God. So, so number one is Montreal. Number two is Vancouver. Number three is Toronto. Uh, in Montreal alone, there's about 300 game studios and mm -hmm. over 14,000 game professionals uh, wor working in the city of Montreal. Uh, and, and in fact, it is, it is one of the largest hubs, uh, most successful hubs for game development in the world uh, is, is right here in Montreal. That's super exciting to hear. And so, yeah, like that's that's some data that maybe for some people in in uh, Canada might be unknown. Sometimes students or people ask me, where do you think that I could have, you know, be in a place where it either actually has many studios, etc. That's a good background to have. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, I understand, of course, you're a figure in the industry. Even your profile is in Wikipedia. It's very exciting. <laughs> And um, you have had so much experience. Mm -hmm. You even were part of the IGDA, as per my understanding. And then after that, you founded Perimeter Partners. So you were apparently giving some strategic guidance comp to companies there. I wonder what main challenges maybe you had there mm -hmm. and that maybe you know gave you great insights for later on continue uh, guiding yes. their companies. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting in that um, the IGDA uh, or, or International Game Developers Association is a global organization, a, a nonprofit that many uh, game developers are members of all over the world. So if you're uh, even as, as a student or an aspiring game developer, but mostly professional game developers, 
it's their uh, professional organization. So they join uh, and the IGDA represents game developers. It works on industry issues. It helps with, you know, uh, education and, and uh, conferences, all, all kinds of stuff. They have local chapters around the world. Uh, it's really there to support the careers of game developers around the world. And so I was very fortunate uh, that for almost nine years, I was the executive director. So the the, the, the director of, of the organization. Uh, and that allowed me to work with game developers all over the world uh, with stakeholders, you know, from, from governments to schools, to publishers and investors, to the studios themselves, really all, all corners of the globe. Um, and so it was a great opportunity to, to meet and connect and to understand their challenges, you know, why were some succeeding? Why were some not succeeding? Uh, um, you know, all, all kinds of fun and interesting uh, things. Um, it was a very challenging role. It was a very rewarding role. You can imagine trying to, you know, help developers' careers and, and businesses all across the globe. Uh, you know, it's a really, really all-encompassing. You know, I, I didn't sleep much, let's uh, let, let's say, for those uh, oh, wow. nine, nine, nine years. Lots of travel, you know, lot, lots of uh, big, big industry uh, issues, uh, et cetera. Um, so when I started Perimeter Partners, which was just a, my small, you know, consulting uh, mm -hmm. agency, um, what I was initially doing was working with governments on, on how they could better support their regional game industry. And so what was happening was, you know, as the game industry grew as a business, as more jobs were created, and these are sort of new economy jobs that are very appealing, well-paying, uh, as game businesses were growing and generating revenue, and in many cases, it's export revenue, so you're bringing new money into the country or to a country, uh, governments realized, oh, wow, the game business is a good business to have, you know, in, in our country. Um, and so then someone in the government who knows nothing about games would be assigned, you know, go figure out how to make more games, how to make more game jobs and more game businesses. And then they would find me as an expert about, you know, ecosystems and, and game economy. And I would help them sort of have the strategy on how to better support, invest and grow in their, their local game industry. And so, you know, I, I was traveling the globe doing work in New Zealand. I was just in Australia last week in Brazil and going to Istanbul and did stuff in Saudi Arabia, you know, all over the place because people uh, at the governmental side see the value of the game industry uh, and how 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 good game jobs are, and they want to have more of them. So that 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 was uh, that was sort of initial th thinking behind perimeter partners. Yeah, that's super exciting. Of course, a lot of insights gathered there. You also, it is my understanding, you also co-founded uh, Execution Labs, which is a hybrid incubator accelerator. Mm. What trends have you observed? in the, the in the in the environment of a uh, gaming the gaming space by you know through through the execution labs which is a little bit of a different ecosystem. yeah yeah so so as you said execution labs was kind of a, a hybrid incubator accelerator uh and we actually started that in 2012 uh so over 10 years ago at the time it was the first venture backed or venture funded uh, a program of that sort in the world. Uh, and we built that here in Montreal. Uh, and we were investing in studios in Canada, in the US and, and Europe. Um, and that, that was a wild adventure. It was my own first foray into investment, uh, you know, on, on the investment uh, or funding uh, side of things. Um, and, and, you know, generated unbelievable insight into what it meant to be a, a, a startup, to be a founder, an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, uh, and also how to support the entrepreneurial journey and how to nurture those teams in order to be successful and to grow and et cetera. Uh, I mean, we were venture back, which meant we were trying to, you know, build businesses that would become very valuable. Um, and, 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 you know, doing that was not uh, always the easiest thing. Um, I think, I think what, to answer your question, one of the things that really has changed over time is is uh, the entrepreneurial identity of game developers that that ten plus years ago, uh, this whole idea of entrepreneurship and startup like it didn't exist. G game developers were and still are creators, makers. They're driven by passion. 
They are artists and designers and, and programmers and musicians and writers. They're not even thinking about business. They're not thinking about funding. They're not thinking about the market. They, they just have stuff that they have to, you know, get out of their brains and hearts and onto the screen. Uh, it is very much a creation and passion driven uh, uh, endeavor. Um, and, and in some cases, and certainly, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it's like, it's like some of them almost willingly ignored the business because they didn't want money to, to taint the beauty of their art, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh no, if I think about econ economics and money, then, then my art won't be pure and my, you know, my voice will be tainted. Like, you know, this kind of very uh, pure artistic, you know, art mm -hmm. with a capital A kind of, kind of approach. Um, and so, and so this whole movement towards indie studios or startup studios was a very weird thing because many of them then struggled with their identity because my incubator now just gave you a hundred thousand dollar check to fund your studio. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, hold on a second. I thought I was supposed to be a starving artist and I had to suffer to make great art, but now you've just given me a check for a hundred thousand and I'm not starving anymore. And so it was actually a really big surprise mm -hmm. that we had where, where many of those initial founders really struggled with mm -hmm. their identity of, of being a kind of a, this, this sort of romantic, you know, indie starving artist uh, type uh, mindset versus mm -hmm. now you're the owner of a business that has just received funding and you have to think about, you mm -hmm. know, commercial liability and sales and growth and all this kind of stuff. I, I think, Probably since then, that's maybe one of the biggest shifts that has occurred where now you do have more founders uh, while they are while they are makers driven by passion. They've also done a better job to embrace an entrepreneurial mindset and kind of merge the, those two identities. So, like, so before it was you were a starving artist suffering for your craft or you were a, a banker business person, sell out, cold blooded, you know, all you cared about was money. Whereas now there's kind of like this in between, which is, you know, you're, you're an artist, but you're, you know, you're thinking about economics and, and it's like, okay to have that in the same, in the same brain. So that, this is at a very, very meta level. It's kind of one of the shifts that I've seen over the past uh, decade. Absolutely. I've seen it myself as well, working with the students, for example, from boot camps, game development, where more and more often, I can start to see how they ask the questions pertaining the business side. What if I want to become an indie developer and not only get the regular career advice of how to get a job, but what if I want to create my own studio? They mm -hmm. have these type of questions now more often. Uh, I also participated in creating a program for entrepreneurship for game development. Yeah. And that was a very exciting process. And also understanding through the one-to-ones, what is what they are really, you know, thinking. So when you say it's, you said a keyword, it's important to mention it here. It's about the mental state that you have, the approach that you have. Yeah. So, so some of us, for some reason, for you know, the conditions where we have been growing up, we just attach ourselves with a fixed identity of that I am only the one that can do the coding. And sometimes they have to break that pattern to realize getting additional tools also might be beneficial if they want to create something like this. Actually, I say it's necessary to start yeah. understanding marketing, sales, publishing, all of these things is super fundamental. And even I say to them, even if you don't go, to create the studio right away is going to enhance your career as a professional from where you are right now. No, it's, it's, a, it's, entrepreneurial. it's great advice. That, that's great advice. It actually makes you more valuable as an employee. Yes. But, mm -hmm. but to extend on that, Diana, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I often speak to students and I'll, and I'll, you know, I'll go to career days, this kind of thing. And you do get some that say, well, I, 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 I my dream, my dream is to be an entrepreneur and have my own studio and, and, and uh, but I think I need to go work at, you know, a big company first. And my advice is always skip the big company. If you really want to be an entrepreneur, the best way to learn how to be an entrepreneur is to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and, and you start now and you're going to learn and fumble and, you know, but you're going to grow and, and, and that, that's how you learn. Because if you go work at, you know, Ubisoft or EA or bio, you know, wherever, what you will learn is how to be a good employee of that company. Nothing wrong with that. 
you you'll get well paid you know you'll learn your craft you'll you'll make cool games but it will not get you closer to starting your own studio and being you know your own boss and being an entrepreneur so you know but both paths are fine yeah. but but if really what you want to do uh-huh. is have your own studio then then you start right away you can skip you know getting a job <laughs> absolutely i i love that i totally agree because it is like the same thing that happens for a developer when they want to create a project the best way to start learning about that is actually creating the project right exactly. it's actually putting yourself hands on Otherwise, people somehow think that going to the company, they are going to understand company things, you know, entrepreneurial things. But it's not the case because the eight hours per day that they are going to be there is going to be enclosed doing a limited task yeah, rather yeah, yeah. than when you start figuring out by yourself everything and through the mistakes, that's how things actually evolve from there. Well, yeah. and, and Diana, to your point, the, the bigger the company, the more narrow yes. and specialized the task <laughs> Like if you if you work at Ubisoft and you're on the Assassin's Creed team, it's like you're you're making eyeballs for three years for the character. <laughs> That's your job is you're the yeah. eyeball guy, and, <laughs> and you know now you're the best eyeball maker in the company, but you know nothing else about anything else works. Yeah. So so yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. Yes, thank you so much. So yeah, developers at this point wonder about things like if I want to send my project to a publisher it is like a mystery thing they really don't know how to navigate things they don't know anything do you have any particular advice or common mistakes that you've seen that people overlook like developers often overlook yeah yeah i mean it's a it's it's a sort of an area that they often don't understand because they've been so kind of closed just in the creation process and not the business process the first thing to remember is that anytime you go seek funding whether it's from an investor, from a, a governmental funding program, a publisher, it, it's it's always the business case that you're pitching. It's not it's not the game alone that you're pitching. And this is a very important lesson for, for younger game makers where they think, well, here's the game I'm working on. I just have to show someone how cool it is and then they'll give me some money. And it doesn't really work like that. You mm-hmm. have to understand the business case of your cool game which does force you to do some market research and who's your audience and and look on Steam and you know do other games in the same category sell well or not and there's all kinds of work to be done there to understand the business case. Once they've done that research and understand that oh I have a good business case, then all of a sudden there's more confidence in going to pitch you know to investors, publishers, uh, uh, granting agencies, etc. The other thing to think about is that. Almost no one will give you money unless you have some amount of traction or some amount of of evidence that your game can succeed. And so the worst thing you can do is, you know, hide in your mom's garage with all the doors and windows closed in the darkness, coding your game for two, three years and don't show anyone, don't tell anyone. It's a big secret. Uh, and then kind of reveal it and try to get funding or, you know, or, or launch it or whatever, you really have to be much more open. You have to, you know, post it online. You have to, you have to, you know, make a demo and get players. You have to run play tests. You have to, you know, post screenshots and, and gameplay videos on, on Twitter and Instagram and Reddit. Like you have to start sharing it even at the very earliest stages to start building an audience, to start growing a community, to start getting likes, you know, you want, you want to post a, tra- a trailer and get, you know, tens of thousands of, of likes and, and reshares. You want to make a post of a cool screenshot of character art or whatever on Twitter. And it gets liked, you know, 5,000 times. And you, you want to get that kind of engagement because that is evidence that success is possible. It's not guaranteed, but that success is looking more and more possible or more and more likely. And then, in part, that's what makes your business case stronger. And then the investors, publishers, granting agencies, et cetera, are much more likely to then you know, put, put the money in or to partner with you. Whereas if you're hiding in a cave the whole time, they'll be like, ah, oh, well, your game you know, looks kind of like 10 other games we saw. How do we know yours is going to be the one that's going to succeed? So what you want to do is start building that evidence, that traction, that social proof, uh, to help demonstrate that. So you have to be much, much more open with your process. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Sometimes they have this common question which pertains to the evaluation of the economics, the business case, which is about monetization. How mm. do I figure out what form of monetization I should have? What are your thoughts on that type of yeah, you know, I mean, this, we, need, we need another hour just to talk about uh, monetization. But uh, I mean, it's usually platform specific. Yeah. So if I'm making a mobile game, then it has to be uh, free to play, which then means the monetization is coming from in-app a combination of in-app purchases and, and advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one very specific uh, path. Uh, if I'm on PC and console, uh, I'm probably making a premium game, which then it's you know twenty dollars or twenty five dollars paid up front. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a pay to play kind of uh, uh, monetization. You know, then you have questions of you know do I have uh, additional content or updates you know after the fact. Um, yeah, so so it's often platform specific, but it's also game style. So. If I was making a multiplayer only online game and it was on P PC, then that would also want, I'd want it to be free to play because if it's multiplayer only, then you want to have a, an open funnel to attract maximum number of users. And then you would monetize with cosmetics and, or maybe a battle pass, this kind of stuff. But um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated than something I can answer mm -hmm. in two, yeah. two, three minutes, but it's, it's mm -hmm. usually about the, the, the platform you're on uh, and then whether you're sort of single player versus uh, you know multiplayer only. Yes, yes, for sure. That's great. And somebody might be wondering in the back of their mind because you're you know into the gaming industry. What are your favorite type of games? Just like out of curiosity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I kind of have to play a lot of games. Uh, <laughs> so, sometimes very very early ones uh, in development or to evaluate oh, lots yeah. of games. Uh, most of my game playing I do on the sofa, right? I'm, I'm here on my computer, you know, all day, every day. So I actually don't play too much on, on my computer. Um, so normally if I'm playing a game, it's because I just want to chill out and relax. And so I'll go sit on the sofa, the big screen, you know, with the Xbox or a PlayStation. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, the, the last game that I played where I, where I really did the whole thing was uh, Tiny Tina's uh, Wonderlands. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of the Borderlands uh, series, and so that was uh, a nice game. I do a lot of racing games as well. Um, uh, played uh, a smaller one called Dredge, which was more of an indie game from a team in New Zealand. Um, I do a lot of mobile games as well, but that's usually more for for work, uh, you know, testing and checking yeah. out developers builds and stuff like that yeah that's like a dream job for many you know wow. <laughs> like sometimes testing things and this sounds like fun for many people. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when 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 you have to do it for work and you know to pay attention and think, you know, ah, it's, so then not it's just, not the same necessarily. Not the same. Yeah, but it's still, you know, it's better than uh, you know digging trenches or whatever. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And approaching the end, maybe one of the last things we'd like to know from you is the the future. You know, the the approach. Mm -hmm. Like, where do you see the gaming industry going? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, oof, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a magic uh, or crystal, mm -hmm. uh, crystal yeah. ball, so it's always hard to predict. I think, I think, based on the trends that we're seeing now, um, it, it's going to be continued movement towards user-generated content, mm -hmm. you know, and, and content creators, yeah. Yeah. where, where, where more and more games are going to be like Roblox and Fortnite, where there are platforms mm -hmm. to play but also to build. Yeah. And some of the players will be builders that will create, you know, experiences within those uh, environments. Uh, and so we're seeing we're seeing that more and more. Um, and, and then that sort of also then links with the whole Twitch effect, right? This whole idea of of, of watching uh, as part mm -hmm. of the fun. Uh, and so more games are being built to be streamable, to be watchable, to be engaging. And what we're starting to also see is that uh, the games have integration with Twitch that allows the audience to affect the gameplay. So, wow. so imagine as you're playing <laughs> and, and I'm watching you play and you get injured, I can, you know, pay to have a, a, a health kit, you know, fall from the sky to heal you so you can keep playing. Uh, oh my goodness. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's not you're not just watching, but like the fans can actually affect. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we're starting. We're starting to see this kind of mm. uh, spectator spectator interaction, uh, which I think is going to be. Uh, it, it's. Eh. I don't know. I think I think this is some of the directions we're, we're going in is, yeah. is kind of games as platforms, user generated content, the whole Twitch, you know, viewing, but also the spectators having, you know, in, uh, some interaction with the gameplay itself. These are some of the things that I think. Wow. To see. And, so then, and then obviously AI is going to be, but, but <laughs> AI, AI is more about streamlining development. Yeah. Although I think we are going to see completely new kinds of gameplay that are driven by real-time uh, generative AI that we haven't barely seen yet. So I think that's coming as well. Yeah, I think at some point we, as let's say users or players, are going to be able to create our own, customize our own experiences, how we actually have it, not right, like before, following a straight line as the developer design it, but we decide many things th thanks to generative AI. Yes. Wow. Amazing insights. And I, I'm super excited. You actually close it with the golden uh, inside here. That's mm -hmm. super interesting. Thank you so much, Jason. Is there anything that you wish I had asked you today? Oh, uh, no. I mean, I mean, for those students that are watching and they do have more business entrepreneurial aspirations and they're not getting that knowledge in school, uh, I mean, my goodness, a quick Google on game business, game funding, game pitching, like, like there is a gold mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, even just putting my name into YouTube or Google, yeah. you'll see a whole bunch of lectures and presentations from other conferences that I've done on pitching and funding and business strategy and how to build a studio. So even if you're not getting that direct knowledge within your academic uh, path, uh, uh, there's no excuse if that's your ambition and, 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 and what you're aspiring to, you know, just Google it, find the resources, and, and there's a ton of knowledge uh, and people are very sharing and open. So, so don't don't let that hold you back. Uh, you know, just just dig in. And as we said before, if you want to be an entrepreneur, the best way is to just be an entrepreneur uh, and and not wait for someone to give you permission. Mm -hmm. Amazing! Thank you so much. This conversation has been super super exciting. It is the best advice uh, there. Uh, you can try to reach uh, to Jason or find more information about him online. Thank Perfect. you so much. Do you have any place where you like a website or something where you can I mean, invite people to check your stuff? I have a crappy website, but uh, uh, just I'm easy to find on Google. Uh, okay. Sorry, on, on LinkedIn or Twitter. You know, I have a yeah. fairly unique name, so I'm easy to find. Okay. Thank you so much. And Thank if you, you like this episode, please consider uh, subscribing or sharing it to someone who really can get a lot of value out of this. Thank you so much and see you in the next episode. Bye for now. Thank you.